Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to church. If you are joining us online, thank you all for joining us online. And uh, we are the Park Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church, in case you didn't know. And uh, we got a lot going on here. And uh, we got an active little church, and it is strong. We've got a beautiful little school, Valdosta Christian Academy, that we're very proud of. And we have a pastor who delivers some awesome sermons that we're very proud of. And we got a lot of ministries within the church that we're very proud of. And some of those ministries have some announcements this morning, as I have a few too. Um, I would like to remind everyone that on Wednesday evening, there is a midweek worship, but it is via telephone. And... Um, uh, Linda kind of heads that up. If you need to know the ins and outs of that and how to be a part of that prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you can talk with Linda. And it's on the bulletin board as you come in. There's a book cork board there, and it's on there. Um, and I think on Monday night, there's Women in Action. Is that what it's called? What? Women on the Move. Women on the Move. Okay. Okay. That's on Monday night, and Cecile, I think, leads that out, so you can get with Cecile on that as well. So there's a lot going on on different nights of the week for us to stay in God's Word. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, too, is there was a book that was left on a pew two or three weeks ago, and we made an announcement about it. It's a real thick book. It's an Ellen White book. It's about end times. There's a lot of highlights in it, and it's a very special book to one of our members. If you just happen to have seen that book in the last few weeks or know where you might have seen it somewhere, would you please get with me or April Spicer? Um, that book has some importance and some heritage to it, and they would love to see if they can track that book down wherever it might have went. Um, and I have a little bit of news this morning that is not so happy. Um, a lot of you know and remember... Um, Vanessa and Fernando um, and Gabby, and they are uh, have been gone for probably about six months now. They're kind of traveling around and staying in different places for a month or two around the world. And uh, we got news this week that Gabby's daddy died suddenly. And, and uh, so I'd like us to keep uh, that family in prayer, and especially Gabby, 
So let's just keep Gabby and the family in prayer as they deal with that and that we can just pray for peace and comfort somehow in that. And um, Hannah has an announcement. I'm going to let her come up and have an announcement. Actually, Hannah, you have a twin. Yes, I do. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Okay, I have a question for you. Who is tired of this summer heat? Yes, me too. So uh, I have another question. Who would like to cool down with some water games and snow cones? Yes, that is correct. Tomorrow, starting at 12 o'clock, we are having our summer party, the VCA fundraiser. Um, Kona Ice, which is a company that does snow cones, is going to drive up onto this parking lot and is going to be selling snow cones so that we can do a fundraiser for VCA. Yes, it is fun. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> um, so we are also going to be doing some water games. We, I have a lot of water balloons, <laughs> and it's going to be fun. So wear something that you can get soaked in and bring an extra pair of clothes. <laughs> also, invite everyone that you know, neighbors, friends, people you want to be better friends with. Get everyone here, OK? Um, also, there will be food. And also, just a precaution, it may storm tomorrow. Um, but you know how Georgia weather is fickle, so <laughs> you never know. Um, but in, in that case, we may move stuff inside, but still, the snow cones will be here. Um, and then just one more announcement. This Friday, we're having the painting Vespers. It's going to start at 6.30. It's going to be really fun. Thank you. OK. Um, and you guys know why I'm up here. I haven't been up here in a few weeks to talk about VBS, but here I am again. Um, so this year, I'm doing a little something different, okay? And I need all my kids to look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Okay, look at me. Um, we're going to be giving away some prizes at VBS this year, okay? Every night that we have VBS, there will be a prize. How do you get your name in the pot for the prize? Okay, glad you asked me that. Um, what we're gonna do is every time that a kid that maybe doesn't go to our church for VBS walks in the door for VBS and I say, who invited you or who's your friend? And the friend goes, Jace, Jace is my friend. We live in the same neighborhood. I say, oh great, Jace invited you. That's awesome. Now we're gonna put Jace's name in the pot for the prize. Guess who has a chance to win the prize that night? Jace. All right, so my thing that I want you to do today while you're here in this building is figure out three friends that you have that don't go to this church that you could invite to VBS, okay? That gives you three chances to win the prizes each night for VBS, at least. And you showing up gets you another one. So how many is that? Three plus one. Three plus one. Great job. <laughs> Glad we can all do simple math. Okay. Um, so um, July 11 through 15 is a regular VBS time um, or days. And then we'll have our closing service at the 11 o'clock service on the 16th. Um, and it will be from 6 to 8. And um, you can see me for the link to register. There's also a QR code on the Adventure Facebook page, Church Facebook page, all that kind of stuff. It's up there on the screen. Um, if you have any questions, please come see me. We will be having our other um, info session for that pretty soon. So volunteers be looking out for information on that. And I will see you guys later. Amen. I have a question for you. What's 628 times 1,840? No. It's not exactly simple math. I'm just kidding. Grace, thank you. I love you. All right. VBS, social life. I mean, we got a little bit of something for everyone. So here we are. So, um... Again, if you're joining us online on Facebook or on YouTube, welcome to our church service this morning. We're glad to have you. Uh, one more prayer request. I would ask if uh, many of you might uh, remember Debbie Redfern. She had knee surgery, 
So I'd like to remember her in prayer this morning as well. And I think the pastor is going to have a prayer after the opening song. Is that right? Yeah? Okay. And so at this time, what we have been doing lately is doing a health nugget with Camille. And she shares with us just some things to keep ourselves healthy. Camille? I know Bobby always tell me to keep it brief. <laughs> I would do my best today. Okay, am I up? Happy Sabbath, everybody. Oh, I have to look at Brenda whenever I do this stuff. She's so calm. But anyway, I know that, um, and I, that I've been gone for the past couple of weeks. But I can assure you that it was mostly to help others in the area of our health ministry. I was able to actually help my sister-in-law who was diagnosed with a condition where she's choosing to do the natural route. <clears throat> and then um, most interestingly, interestingly enough, last Sunday I was able to meet with a special group of people who is not of our faith. And one of the gentlemen after we were, I was finished with the presentation, said, which church do you go to? Because I need to, I need to come there. And that was a very, help me out, please. Just do it for me. Yes. Um, that's a very, very interesting group. And I definitely um, encourage us to really, really try to understand and, and learn the health laws that we have because they are coming. And they, they, they are going to have a lot of questions. If it's not from scripture, it's going to be about health. And we need to be ready for them. Okay, so that was just a, um, a quick, quick reminder. How many of you remember what disease is? This is just a quick reminder. Anybody remember what disease is? Anybody can say what disease is? Come on, tell me something, somebody. Okay, I, I, I hear illness. Let's just look at it. Disease is an effort of nature, how our bodies function, okay? To rid the system of conditions that are a result of a violation of the laws of health. Whatever it is that we do, if we're violating the laws of health, we will get a disease or dis-ease. And so what are the laws of health? You know this. Somebody tell me something. Sunshine. I see somebody's lip. I'm, I'm reading lips. Exercise. Uh-huh. What else? Fresh air. Uh, okay. How many are there? How many health laws are there? Really, there's 10. You know of eight, but there's actually 10. Let's take a look at them. Pure air, sunshine, abstemiousness or temperance. Rest, exercise, proper nutrition, the use of water, divine, I'm um, trusting divine help or trusting God, and then it's cleanliness and purity of mind. How you think has a big deal on how your health is. Yes. It's temperance. Temperance is, okay, anybody can tell me what temperance is? Yes, Stefano. Uh-huh, the good use. Okay, so it's moderate use of good things and avoiding, eliminating, not using anything that's bad. No. Right. No, no, not anything. Do, do good things in moderation and stay away from everything that's bad. Stay away from drugs, alcohol. Don't, do any, don't put any of that in your body at all. But if you're going to eat fruits, nuts, and vegetables, especially with nuts, you don't want to overdo it. You want to be temperate and moderate, just a handful of nuts after your meal. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have talked about all of these except nutrition because that is one of the biggest ones. And this is the one that a lot of people tend to associate with illness is nutrition. Maybe I ate something bad or some, nobody's going to think, oh, I didn't get enough sunshine today. This is why I'm sick. But that could be one of the reasons why people are sick, because of the lack of vitamin D. That's right. Thank you, Cecile. 
Okay. So, um, however, while that is partially true as far as nutrition contributing to disease, we now understand that disease is an effort of nature to rid the system of conditions that's a violation of any of the laws of health. If we are depressed because we do not trust God, guess what? Depression can cause you to be sick, and depression is a sickness in and of itself. Okay? So, um, however, nutrition does play a direct or an important role in the development of disease as well, as well as um, eradicating them. Um, I think it was yesterday I was listening to a story. It's me. Help me out here. Go to the next slide for me. Right. I was listening to a story about a man who was um, 400 pounds who had diabetes. I am not sure of which of the eight types of diabetes. Did you know that there's eight types of diabetes? Anybody? Okay, I'll just put it up there because I'm not going to go into it right now. But he was so very sick that he was on 200 units of insulin. Okay, one unit can make a big difference to your body. And he was also taking 2,000 milligrams of metformin. Okay, as this man was listening to some health lectures by um, a medical missionary, he asked if the medical missionary could help him. They had, a co they had a consultation, and within one day, they say that truth is stranger than fiction, one day, he actually, um, by implementing a specific, um, one of the law changing one of the laws that he was doing, he actually um, cut his need for insulin by 100 units. Okay, this is the truth. And then um, after, within five days, this same man was able to eliminate all 220 units of insulin as well as the 2,000 milligrams of metformin. This is the truth within five days. Um, they say that truth is stranger than fiction. This is truth because we have been taught to believe lies so many for our whole lives, but the God that we serve is what? The truth, right? He is able to do anything and everything for our good if we will but follow his instructions. Would you like to know which one of the laws this man changed? Who said it? Right. It was his diet. He went to a 100%, thank you, plant-based diet. And it, was, it has a lot to do with how our body responds to what we eat. Let me share this one thing with you. One thing I've learned from this, listen to this story in depth, there's more to it than that, is that once we change one thing with our diet, just to do something good, all the other ailments in our bodies will improve. When somebody has diabetes, it's one disease, but usually you, they have high blood pressure, they have high cholesterol. But if you change the diet to match what God says in Scripture in the spirit of prophecy, it's not just going to deal with diabetes. It's going to deal with the heart disease. It's going to deal with the cholesterol. I mean, just imagine what can happen to you if you just eat the right things. And I'm not going to tell you what to eat, but I'm going to encourage you to come as close as possible to a plant-based diet. Okay? Do your best. I mentioned earlier that there are people who would love to come to our church simply because of our health message. We have been told that the health message is what? The right arm to the gospel. It does not take away Pastor Day because they're going to need him. And everybody else who do Bible studies and encourage others. But we need both of them. This message can change life for the better or for the mind, the body, and the spirit. And I am asking and I am appealing to you. Let us do all that we can to encourage each other as well as those who will come to prosper in health as um, <clears throat> the Lord said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as I so prosper. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Camille. All right. I wanted also, I was reminded this morning... Um, our friend Nick that has been attending, uh, he is not here this morning. So I'd ask if we would keep Nick in prayer this morning. He woke up and has got some some things going on and couldn't make it this morning. So uh, I'm asking for prayer for Nick this morning. Nick, we miss you. We look forward to seeing you next, next week. All right. So, 
it is time for our call to worship. And because I don't think we have anyone uh, scheduled for call to worship, I thought I would do that this morning myself. And our call to worship is from Hebrews chapter 10, 23. You don't have to turn there. I can read it to you, but if you'd like, it's Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10.23 reads, Let us hold fast the confession. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. For he who promised is faithful. We talk about faith a lot, don't we? Well, he who promised is in these words right here, he is absolutely faithful, 100%. So let's keep that in mind. And that's our call to worship. I'm going to ask, I think Brenda's going to come up and, oh, no, Pastor Day is going to come up and have our opening prayer. And then Brenda is going to come up and lead us in a song. All right. been gone one week and you forgot about how everything works when that's the other way around you switched it up <laughs> happy sabbath everyone it's good to be back camp meeting was good um we all need to go next year or as many of us i missed you guys and it was just great we need to plan for it i already have the date so we need to you know push it so that we can all make a trip and uh, be spiritually filled why don't you join me in this prayer? And I'd like to ask at this time if there is anyone with a special request. Um, if you can come forward, we can come here, and um, or by the raise of your hand. But if you'd like to come here, I'd like to say a special prayer for you. Amen. Amen. I'm not Jesus, but Jesus did say, "Come unto me, all who are weary, tired, heavy laden." And I will give you rest. And just as Brother Bobby has read, he is faithful. Come together. Amen. Amen. All right. And uh, surely everyone uh, or all of you have something as well. So let's just pray for those things here. That's fine. Take a seat. Lord, we come before you at this time, some of us kneeling, not because kneeling is necessary for you to hear, but simply as a symbol that we are but dust. From dust we came, from dust you made us, and to dust we shall return unless you come first. And this is just a symbol, Lord, that we recognize you as our God, as our Savior, and to show you how much we are dependent upon you. Lord, here you have seen some people come forth with things happening. They are asking you. Lord, I repeat the words of one of your disciples. Lord, who else would we go to? Only you have words of life. And I would add that you give words that give life in whatever situation. Lord, perhaps there are some who are dealing with health. We praise you for the message that you have left for us in Scripture to be healthy and to mind, be mindful of what we eat, exercise, and all of those things so that we could remain healthy. But Lord, in this world of sin, sometimes sickness gets us even after that. So we come to you, and we ask for you to heal us, for you to give us what we need, for you to give our bodies what we need. You created these 
wonderful bodies, Lord. And you are the heavenly mechanic that can tune us up. So tune us up, Lord. Surely there are spiritual requests here too. Those of us who are struggling to temptation, who are falling short of your glory, who need to be forgiven and covered with the blood of Jesus. Lord, forgive us of our sins. There is none righteous, not even one. And Lord, we are stuck with these bodies that are subject and inclined to sin and we need a Savior in our lives. Not a Savior just 2,000 years ago, which we are so thankful for, but a Savior today. So send us your sweet spirit to live within us that we may have fruit for your glory. And Lord, surely there are grateful hearts here. Joyful hearts rejoicing on the Sabbath day that we could come together and have this awesome date with you. This time that we can be together with one another and with you, Lord. We are so madly in love with you. We love singing to you. We love serenading you. Just in a moment, we will give you an awesome serenade because you are worthy, Lord. And Lord, we... We want to hear what you have to say back. We want to hear from you for our lives because we rejoice being in communion with you. It is such a great ordeal that we could come together and worship you still in these troubled times. And for that, we say thank you. We give you praise, and we're going to soak it up, Lord. We're going to soak up this moment with you because we love you, and we want to be more in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Let's all stand as we lift up our voices and sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Jesus. 
we do have something to sing about this morning, don't we? Uh, let's um, turn over. If you're using your hymnal, page 73. Holy, holy, holy. is now for the kids to come up for a children's story. But first, they're going to come and get a basket and take to all the bigger people. And you're going to put money in here, right? Yeah. The offering that the kids come and pick up, whether it's a couple quarters or a couple dollars or like 20 or $50, goes to our school. It helps with worthy student. For the kids who can't afford, here, guys, just grab a basket. Couple more. There you go. Oh, she needs one behind you. There. All right, kids. Smile. Smile at the adults.
And for any of you adults who know kids that need good Christian education, uh, she is taking applications. On the back of the bulletin is phone number where you can call or check with one of most any of us adults here. If you're interested in sending maybe a grandchild or your child or the neighbor's child or somebody to our school. Okay, dump it in there. Thank you. Good job. Put your basket right in there. Inside. Yes, there we go. That works. Okay, come and have a seat up here on the front, and I just lost all the baskets. Bobby, we got some more. Well, we got some more. Woo. There we go. <laughs> it was summer vacation. Are you of all of you on summer vacation now? Yay, school's out for a little while. It was summer vacation, and Brent and Joe were so excited because Mom and Dad just told them that they were going to go on a vacation. You know, some of us take what's called staycations, where we stay home and do stuff, but they were going to go somewhere, and they were so excited, and Dad gave them each an envelope with some money in it and said, this is for you to spend because we're going to stop different places and you might find something you want to buy, maybe a souvenir, but this is all you get. If you spend it all and we stop somewhere else, this is all you get. I'm not giving you more money, so you better take care of it. Well, Joe said, <clears throat> I want to keep my money and stuck it in his pocket. And Brent said, know what I'm going to give my envelope to mom because then I'm going to think about do I really want to spend the money wherever I am mom said okay whatever well they got in the car and started off and they'd been traveling several hours and they stopped at the gas station and there was a little store there and the boys went in and looked around oh there was some candy and they're like no let's not spend our money on candy so they got back in the car and stopped the night, put, it, put their tent out, and next morning they started off and mom said, you know what, we probably need to stop somewhere and get some insect repellent because the mosquitoes were bad last night. So they found a store and the boy said, can we go in with you, can we go in? Mom said, sure. And so they went in the store and mom found the insect repellent and a couple things they needed for their for the next night, that night when they were camping. Well, Joe decided to go look at the toys and he found a toy that he'd never seen before. It had marbles in it and a little thingy that you ping and it hit the marbles. And, oh, he just had to have that. And Brent's going, but that takes most of your money. Well, I know, but that's okay, I'm gonna spend. So he got it. They got in the car and he played with it for quite a while and then he got bored and stuck it off to the side. The next day he played with it some more. Well, later that day, dad said, tomorrow we're going to stop at the Old Pony Express station. Some of you have maybe heard about that in history class where the, the ponies would start on one side of the country and take the mail across the country. And the boys were like, oh, we heard about that and we've read about it in history class. And this is just, oh, this is going to be so cool. And they got in the store in the little shop and there was a man who was dressed like one of the Pony Express men and he told them stories and there was old newspapers and, oh, this was just so cool. And Brent looked around and said, 
oh, there's, there's hats and there's belt buckles. And he said, oh, I like that belt buckle. And he said, and I have enough money. And so he went and got his money from mom. And Joe is going, oh, I want one too. And so he, he had only a couple dollars. In the meantime, Brent got the belt buckle he wanted and he paid for it. He was so, oh, this was just so cool. And Joe is going, um, Dad, can I borrow some money? And Dad goes, uh-uh. If there's nothing left of your money, that's it. Well, he learned a lesson. Not to spend his money on stuff he didn't need. Because sometimes there's something more important that comes along. You know, there's a Bible verse in Proverbs that says, I'm waiting for it to change it because I don't have it. It says, a wise man or a wise child thinks ahead. That would be like Brent. He thought ahead. A fool doesn't think and he brags about it. Kind of like Joe. Oh, look at the toy I got. And later went, uh-oh. I didn't think so well. So maybe we need to do that. Whether it's with our money or the things we have, think about it. And are you going to be a fool or a wise person? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us to remember to be wise in everything that we do. And we thank you for Sabbath. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of being wise with our money, that's like the perfect children's story to lead right into the offering. We're called to be wise with our money. So that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to ask the Lord to do is to hold us accountable for the money that we collect in tithe and offering. And I just want to remind everybody in the bulletin you can see you know, how much money we've collected this month and what our budget is and where we're at and all that. And it says the loose, and somewhere in the bulletin, I'm not reading it exactly, but it says the loose offering is what our church functions on. And that is true, but over and above that, our church functions on the offerings. And there's a distinct difference between tithe and offering. Our tithe is what we return to the Lord, and the Bible instructs us that it's about 10%. Some families give more. Whatever, however the Lord works it in your family and for you personally is just absolutely fine. But the offerings, that's over and above tithe. And the offerings is exactly what our church functions on. So I'm asking you to remember that when you fill out the tithe envelopes or if you're watching online and there's a link on there, if you go to there and you're returning your tithe and offering, the offering is what we function on here and what guides and funds our ministries here at the church, our live stream, our AV team up there, our young adult team, our college student miss missionaries, our school, um, my goodness, VBS program that's coming up. I mean, all that functions on our local church budget. And that's where the offerings come in. So I'd ask you to remember that as you return. So with that, I'm going to ask if the deacons would come forward. They're going to come around and collect the money. And we're going to pray over this money, very similar to Brenda's story. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to return to you. Even just, it's all yours, Lord, but thank you for the opportunity that we can return a portion of our increase to help further your word, to help further our church, and to help further your salvation to others, whether it be through VBS, our world missionaries through our conference, um, our conference events like camp meeting, just everything, Lord, we just thank you. And we ask a blessing upon this money that's collected that it would go for nothing else but to further your word and your love. 
In Jesus' name, amen. While the offering's being collected, um, I thought I would just uh, say a little something to those of you watching online, to all of us here. Uh, it's been mentioned this morning about from VBS, if you know friends or neighbors, and to bring, invite kids in your neighborhood or your, your children's friends to come to our VBS program. And not only is that good for our VBS program, but I want to add that we can keep in mind our friends and our, our children's friends that might benefit from a really strong Christian education in a Christian environment. And we are fortunate enough to have Valdosta Christian Academy right here at our church, grades K through eight. So if you know anyone that might be interested, just see whoever our school principal, Ms. Reyes, our pastor, Pastor Day, you can see me, um, and we will answer any questions, and we would love to have that enrollment. And I think uh, somebody mentioned this morning that they are definitely taking applications, and enrollment is in full swing right now for next year, which starts probably August, I guess. The school year would start in August, so it's right around the corner. So as we prepare for that, just remember who it might be and we have ways to help kids come to our school even financial ways sometimes so so let's keep that in mind so I'm gonna ask Mark there's Mark Dan I'm sorry I'm the book of Mark is what I'm thinking there you go Dan. thank you Bobby good morning church <clears throat> how you doing uh, I want you to take your pew Bible or your Bible that you brought with you. It doesn't matter what version it is. And also, if you speak another language, I know there's some people here who speak Spanish. If you have a Spanish Bible, pick it up. And we're all going to read this together. In the Jewish economy, in the Jewish tradition, in the synagogues, the scriptures were read out loud. And there's something about when you, when you speak the word of God, with your own voice, with your own tongue, uh, it does something to your soul, doesn't it? So today, get your Bible. It's Mark 8. Mark 8. And we're going to be starting to read together verse 34. So make sure you are you there. Are you with me? Do you have a Bible? All right. Here we go. All together. Then he called. I don't hear anybody. Let's start over again. Here we go again. Start over. Here we go. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Amen. That's right. Who gets this? we go. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Is the mic still on? It is. Can y'all hear me? Am I coming? There it is. There it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. April, come on up here, girl. April has got our special music this morning. And uh, keep in prayer, too. One day soon, there's going to be a very serious testimony come before this church from this family right here. Truth is harder than a lie Dark seems safer than the light Everyone has a heart that loves to hide I'm a mess and so are you we build walls nobody can get through. Yeah, it may be hard, but the best thing we could ever do, ever do, is 
bring your brokenness and I'll bring mine cause love can heal what hurt divides and mercy's waiting on the other side if we're honest if we're honest don't pretend to be something that you're not living life afraid of getting caught there is freedom found when we lay our secrets down at the cross at the cross so bring your brokenness and i'll bring mine because love can change our lives it will set us free it's what we need to be so bring your brokenness and I'll bring mine cause love Love can heal what hate divides. Do I need to keep talking? No, it's not going to be. Because I get loud. God is good, amen? amen. All the time? God is good. Thank you, April. That was beautiful. Such a powerful message and song. Thank you, Brother Dan. That was wonderful. Um, to partake in the tradition, the Jewish tradition. Um, the Jewish um, culture, they have lots of great traditions that I think we could benefit from. Um, yeah, will you join me in a, a prayer, one more prayer? Lord, we thank you so much because you are good. We have sung. We have elevated our thoughts through song, through your word, through community. And now we are hungry. Uh, we're wanting to hear from you. So, Lord, I pray beyond everything that that I may be forgotten completely. It's a little hard here with the family. I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of family. But for the moment, Lord, I pray that I would be, I would decrease.
and that Jesus may increase. Hide me in the shadows behind the cross that it may be lifted up and that you may be lifted up with it. Because it was that cross or the person on the cross, the person of Jesus who died for me, who died for this church, who died for this world. It was him, not me, Lord. My seasons change, but you, you remain the same. And it is you who we want to hear from. Amen. You must deny yourself. You all read it. And surely before today, you've heard this before. Have you heard this before? By the show of hands, who has heard the phrase, you must deny yourself? Okay? What did you think of? Maybe we can get some interaction here. What did you think of? Think about a time when maybe someone said you must deny yourself to you. Um, can anyone share maybe a little bit of context uh, in what situation? To put someone else ahead of yourself. Yeah, I mean, we know, we know what it means, but like a time where it's a specific situation where someone said to you, hey, you must deny yourself at this moment, at this time. It's interesting. Huh? Oh, in baptism. What do you mean by it? How did you take it? Okay. All right. So thank you for sharing. For those of us who are, are, are watching, just want to recap. So basically, our brother here saying that uh, to deny oneself, uh, he understood it right before baptism, is to give up sort of like our own desires, and surrender them to God, which equals trust, right? To deny yourself could equate to trust. I like that. Uh, Sister Camille. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so for those watching, again, once again, uh, Sister Camille shared that uh, when you're feeding the homeless or whatnot or in a situation, you know, you're hungry, but you have to feed others first. And that's a, that's a form of denying oneself, right? It's not fun many times. It's not fun. could be rewarding afterwards, but... Not fun. It's interesting. Yesterday evening, I was speaking with my niece. She's a she's a little girl, and uh, you know she was telling me about how much money she's got. She's got a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> got lots of money. And I said, uh, well, how? she said, guess how much money I have. I said, I don't know. You have five dollars? She's like, no, no. It's way more than that. I said, are we, are we talking, what are we talking, double digits here? She's like, yes. I'm like, okay, I, what you got, like $10? She's like, no. I'm like, is it, is it like 20? She's like, it's in the 20s. <laughs> uh, 23? She's like, no. I'm like, no, I meant to say 27. She's like, how did you know? <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> because I knew <laughs> after like five tries. <laughs> how did you know? $27. And, um, you know, I was like, that's great. That's great. That's a lot of money. Wow. Um, how did you get that money? And then she's like, well, you know, my grandpa gives me sometimes, my mom, my dad. And she's, she's a little bit of a saver. And I said, um, hey, do you give tithe and offering? She's like seven. 
And she said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, well, it's when, um, you know, when you go to church and you see, like, people give, like, back to God. And she said, mm-mm. <laughs> and I'm like, why not? Sharing is caring. And she's like, uh, I like to save my money, right? And uh, we had a nice little chat. And I said, but you know, God gives you lots of things. God gives you your dad, your mom. A lot of kids don't have a dad or a mom. They have jobs. They're healthy. They have your house. Uh, you can get toys. God gives us all of these things. And... When we give of ourselves, uh, and not just money, but other things, we are, in a sense, denying ourselves, and we are giving back because we have been blessed. You see, God blesses us so that we could bless others. And I said, and if you practice that, you will see that you will control your money and your money will not control you. Because money is a great resource. Can we get amen? amen? Without money, we couldn't have, you know, what we have. It's a necessary thing. And money isn't evil. The love of money is evil. So if it's hard to let go, we have to ponder that. Who's in control here? In fact, giving and denying oneself is a form of taking control back. It's like saying, you know what, I'm in control here. You know, and not just that, but I believe that with that attitude, God is seeing in someone, hey, I can bless this person. Because I know that when I bless him or when I bless her, my blessings will be extended. And isn't that such a great thing to, to bless others? God could bless them, but he gives us the opportunity and he gives us the chance to bless others. And what a rich blessing that comes with to be able to give to those because we are blessed. It's such a wonderful thing, but surely you have heard, deny yourself. And this is one form of denying oneself. But thank you, Brother Dan, one more time for having us all read this. When Jesus said, deny yourself, let's go back to our text here, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And by the way, I hope you have your phones or your Bibles, buckle up. Because we're going we're gonna to run to and fro between a couple of verses. Okay, so get ready. I want you to lick your fingers or whatever it is you do to turn those pages. Okay? So Mark 8, 34. And I need some help because you know my vision starts getting blurry up here. And sometimes I, I don't read what's on there. So I need your help. Okay? It says here, Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, who's speaking here? Okay, do you want to be a follower of Jesus? Can I get an amen? If, if and only if you want to be a follower of Jesus. If you do not want to be a follower of Jesus, you can remain quiet. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, can I get a hearty amen? Amen. Okay, hallelujah. We're all in this. Okay, so Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you all said amen. I'm here as a witness. And you know what? I didn't say amen. So amen. Okay, so I got to make mine there. If I want to be a follower of Jesus, you must. What does it say? No, 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 no. It says, I advise for you to. No, no uh, I think it would be a good idea to deny yourself. Is that what your Bible says? 
What does it say? You must. It is necessary. Now listen. Listen. Maybe right now, I don't know, maybe you're having some feelings. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is all of this? You know, this whole Christianity thing, all of these rules and regulations. Hey, listen. The truth is, that, that's an if statement. Did you catch it? Jesus said, if what? If you want to be my follower, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, then you must deny yourself. If you don't want to be a follower of Jesus, that's totally fine. That's fine. No one's forcing you to deny yourself. Certainly, God is not. I love Jesus when he was in his earthly ministry, did he ever say, I mean, he sometimes, the invitation was kind of like, Bobby, follow me. It was kind of like, follow me. But it was still an invitation. That is to say that Bobby or whoever it was in Bible times, they could still say no. As a matter of fact, there was a rich, young ruler found in John chapter 10, I believe. You guys can double check me on that. I'm not sure. And Jesus said, hey, go and sell all of your to the poor or, and feed the poor or something along the line, paraphrasing here, and follow me. And the Bible says, if you remember that story, that the rich young ruler, he did it. He couldn't do it. And he couldn't do it. Why? He had, the Bible says, many possessions. He needed to deny himself. And what did Jesus do? I love the Bible, especially in John. That, 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 uh, that story is found in, in different places. But you can look it up later. But it says right there, Jesus loved him. Another sermon for another day. But Jesus loved him. So Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do. Jesus loves you. My seasons change, but he remains the same. And Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you must deny yourself. And now, we have said a couple of different things about denying oneself, but what does Jesus say is denying oneself? What does your Bible say? He gives a definition here. What's the next phrase? Mm -mm, you must deny yourself. Ah, take up your, take up your, and follow me. Now, I want us to understand, I really appreciate it, Dan, this whole thing you did with the Jewish culture, because oftentimes we read the Bible with uh, our modern culture, with our eyes. And so you may be reading this Bible text, and you may be saying, take up your cross. Oh, well, that's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. That's talking about the cross. That's talking about being Christian because that's what the cross represents in our world. But in the time where Jesus was speaking to his disciples, this is not what the cross resembled. In the time of Jesus, the cross did not have all the positive association that it has today. When we see a cross, we know that could mean a hospital. That could mean a church. That could mean feeding the homeless. If it has a cross behind it, we know that it has the message of Jesus behind it. But that's here on this side of time. But when we travel back to the time of Jesus, and Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's telling them, hey, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. And let me explain to you what that means. Take up your cross. 
wait, what? Lord, what are you talking about? Peter, hey, what does that mean? I don't know, John. What? what, what? The cross is like punishment. It's Roman punishment. Roman punishment to the worst of criminals. Is he saying that we should be criminals? What, what are you talking about? I, I suppose that we could say, if we were to paraphrase this to 2021, and I'm not even sure if this would even apply, but if anyone wants to follow me, you could deny yourself and do death row. But even that quite doesn't cut it because the system I, it tries to be as humane as possible, even in execution. But the Romans were not. The Romans wanted to be th this to be the worst kind of death. You were up on a cross because you were the worst of criminals, and the Roman Empire wanted to make an example. This is what happens. And, you know, even in the imagery, we see Jesus up there, you know, naked, half naked, but he's half naked. You know, he's typically on a cross. You were completely naked, embarrassed, humiliated. And it was just, what, Jesus, what do you talk? Take up your cross. That's what it means to follow you? Please turn with me to Romans chapter 6. What could all this mean? Paul here gives us a bit of a clarification to perhaps what Jesus meant. <clears throat> of course, Jesus knew where he was headed, but the disciples had no idea. And yet the message was still there. If you want to deny, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. And it says right here, Romans chapter 6, verse 5. You there with me? Okay. Since we have been, what? United. I, I, want, I want you not to forget that word. Tuck it in the back of your mind. Since we have what? Been united with him. Who is him? Jesus. Okay. I, I, let, let's, let's slow down for a second. Since we have been now united. So if we are united, what is the implication of how the condition was before? We were separated. Because we are sinful. And that sin caused separation between, between us and God. But now Paul says, since we have been united with him. And Paul, how did we unite with him? What does it say there? In his death. And by the way, what kind of death was that? On a cross. Very interesting. We will also be raised to life. Hallelujah. As he was. Because see, Paul was talking about a time in a time period where Jesus died. He rested on the Sabbath, and then he rose again. And Paul somewhere in there says, listen, if Jesus didn't rise again, then we preach in vain. But praise God that he rised again, that he rose again. And if we are united with him in his death, if we deny ourselves, if we take up our cross, then rest assured that we also will be raised to life as he was. Woo, that's giving me chills because I like to live. I don't know about you. Do you like to live? Can I get an amen? I have so many ideas. I am right brain for sure. I'm creative. And the thought of death just kind of gets me a little anxious because there's so much I want to do. And I'm like, man, I want to do everything and there's no time for anything. I like to live. And praise God, it says that if we are united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Verse 6. We know that our what? Old sinful selves or our old man was, what is that word? Crucified 
with Christ. So that what? Whew. Might be, so sin might be utterly destroyed. Here my version says, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Oh, I need that, Lord. Can you say that with me? I need that, Lord. Because sin has power in my life. I'm the first to admit it. I am no one special here preaching to you because I have somehow made the pinnacle absolutely now. Sin has power in my life, and I need freedom from that. I need to be free. And it says here, if we are crucified, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. So we are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died, with who? With Christ. We were set free. From the power of sin. Oh, that's exciting stuff. I don't know about you. But for me, that is super exciting stuff. Because Paul here also compares this denying oneself or this uh, 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 putting oneself to death. Or one can say killing oneself with a cross. And that's very interesting to me because... There are many ways one can kill themselves. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there are suicides. That's very unfortunate. I don't know if you knew this, but when I was working at Beautiful Minds uh, Mental Health, um, there was a stat on the newspaper that was just rattling for me um, in that area in Auburn, California. This news uh, article said, there are more suicides um, it, from the uh, people from the ages of 30 and below. There are more suicides than there are COVID fatalities. In 2020, when this thing was like, there are more suicides than COVID. And then it says, but nobody is talking about that. Because Mental health. People are dealing with mental health issues. And nobody is talking about that. Unfortunately, there are many suicides. And one can commit suicide in many different ways. We're not going to go into detail about that. But Paul here is saying that to follow Jesus, to obtain this resurrection, one must commit suicide. What? Hold on, wait, let, let me see you here. Because Bobby is looking at me weird, so I'm going to call him out here. Bobby, you read verse 6 for me. Read it. So... We must put self to death. You know, there's this song. I don't mean, by the way, I got to say these things, right? I don't mean go commit suicide. This is not literal, okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> I got to say these things. You know, as a public speaker, you cannot say these things because somebody will take a clip. Listen, there's a song that um, I love the line. It's so clever. It says, it says um, loving you, speaking of Jesus, and I'm going to mess this up. I know it. It says, loving you will be the death of me. It's a Christian. It's a gospel song. And, you know, I was listening with Vanessa, you know, in the spirit. And I had heard it before, but it was her, her first time listening to it. And it says, loving you will be the death of me. And then she's listening like, that's horrible. <laughs> Loving you will be the death of me. And then, and then I'm like, wait, wait for it. There's another line. <laughs> Just relax. And then it says, but that's how it's supposed to be. 
That's how it's supposed to be. The death of me, the death of this old man, the death of this man that has sin and, 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 and this skin right here, the, this sinful nature, okay? I don't know about you, but I struggle with this. Can I get a mercy if you struggle with this? Mercy, mercy is right. I struggle with this. I struggle with this sinful nature and my inclination to it. But Paul says that we must commit suicide for the visuals, okay? Quote, unquote, for the audio, okay? But it's interesting. There's many ways that we can put ourselves to death. But how many of you could crucify yourselves? Because he's not saying don't commit just any suicide. You must crucify yourself. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we could probably go like, okay, ah, Okay, uh, maybe. What? You cannot do it. Can you say it with me? You cannot do it. You must put yourself to death by crucifying self, but you cannot do it. You know, God says these things. They're so, um, I don't know what to call them. It just reminds me of the Red Sea. You remember the Red Sea? Like, you know, the, the, they had the Red Sea. It hasn't been opened yet, right? And then everybody's freaking out. Oh, no, the Egyptians are after. They're right there. They're coming. We're doomed. We wish we would have gone back. Da, 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 da. And then God says, be still. Move forward. What? Well, which one is it, God? Be still or move forward. And it reminds me of that. You must put yourself to death. Okay, I'm going to put myself to death. But you have to do it by crucifixion. Wait, what? I can't. I know you can't. It's a gift. Someone has to do it for me. Capital S. Someone has to do it for me. It's a gift. It's the work of God. Only Jesus can do this work for you. Because you see, we have two natures. How many? Two. Two. Turn with me quickly to Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. Okay? Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. There's two natures within us. Well, maybe, and I'll explain in just a second. Maybe there's two. Okay? There's one for sure. I still hear the Bible is turning, so I love it. I love it. Okay. Right there, Psalm chapter 51, uh, verse 5. It says, for I was born a saint. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at my blurry vision. I was born in iniquity. I was brought forth in iniquity. My version says, I was born a sinner. Don't we say that children are innocent? Really? They are born sinners. Listen, this little conversation that I'm having here with my niece about denying oneself, the natural tendency is what? No. The other stuff has to be taught, and later the Holy Spirit has to work it. We are born sinners, and if you were a born sinner, can you say mercy? Mercy. If you recognize it, see, we were born in iniquity from the moment that cute little baby, as much as I love Julian and as much as I want to say, you know, he, the little guy is perfect. He, he hasn't done anything wrong. No, 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 no. This virus called sin flows in his veins. And all of us certainly have at least this nature. Okay. I said that we all have two natures, but wait. We all at least have one. Well, what is this other nature that you're talking about? Well, let's turn to John chapter 3. Okay? John chapter 3. Maybe now, you know, and, and you're going to say, oh, John 3, 16, is that what you're going to read? Well, no, not quite, but John chapter 3. Now, um, Nicodemus was a little bit confused, right? But it says right here in John chapter 3, verses 5, okay? And you know what? We're... 
<laughs> we're going to read from verse 3, okay? From verse 3. So Jesus replied, okay, because we are all born in, in sin, okay? So Jesus says, hey, listen, he's saying the same thing that Paul was saying. Remember Paul? Paul said, hey, if you want to rise again with Jesus, you have to crucify this old man, right? But then here, Jesus is now speaking to Nicodemus, one of the religious leaders, and he says to him, verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you are, what's that word? Born, Born again. You maybe will enter the kingdom. Is that what it says? Look at these absolutes. If you want to be my follower, you must deny yourself. If you want to... I t if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, or he reversed it, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What does cannot mean? Impossible. So at the pearly gates, whatever that looks like, the question will not be, hey, what did you do down there? And down there, I'm not even sure if that's correct, but... What did you do on earth? Hey, what are all your good deeds? What are all your bad deeds? Remember that, Megan? The, the, the little skit thing? That's not going to be the question. The question is going to be, were you born again? And look, Nicodemus is just as confused as we are. What are you talking about? What do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus. <laughs> How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? I swear. You know, sometimes when you say stuff, when you're preaching, you have to just be literal. You can't say, you know, we must commit suicide because, you know, like, oh, you know. No, Nicodemus, I am not talking about you have to go back inside your mother's womb to then be born again. No, let me explain it to you. Verse 5, I assure you, he repeats it, that some people can enter the kingdom of God. Is that what it says? What does it say in your Bible? Unless one be born of two things. Water and the spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born of Water, what do you think that's talking about? Baptism. Baptism. Unless you are born again through baptism, you cannot. You cannot dance around it. Another sermon for another day with what happened to the thief on the cross. Was he baptized? Oh, that's a good sermon, but we'll leave it for another day. But let's not talk about them. Let's not worry about the thief on the cross. Let's talk about you right now. Because you are not a thief on the cross, although it could be argued that that's what we're wanting to say, right? Maybe you should be. But you have the opportunity today to be born again of water. And when you are born of water, something happens. It's called the miracle. You are born of the spirit. It's a simultaneous type thing. You are born of water through faith. You deny yourself, just like my brother pointed out. And then you are born of the spirit. What does that mean? <laughs> this is all mumbo jumbo. OK, First John, I told you we'd be jumping around here. First John. First letter of John, verse chapter 3. Okay, First John 3. Wait, I went to third. First John 3, verses 9. Everybody's talking about the same thing here. Okay? Everybody is talking about the same thing. Everything, every little step that we take just brings us a little bit clearer and clearer. Okay? Are you, with, are you there? It says right there, those who have been what? Born of God. They sin.
so have you been born of God according to what that says? That you're not sinning. Who's not sinning here? Who didn't sin this past week? Let me put my hand down because I did. It's clear. Those who have been born of God do not sin. Thank goodness. Thank goodness that there is a for or a because on that. Because to me, I would be very scared. And right now, you may be. Whoa. Why? What does the Bible say? Because? No, no, no. Read the Bible. Don't tell me what you think, Bobby. I want to know what the Bible says. <laughs> Woo! What? Oh, ho, ho. because his what? His seed. What? His seed is where? Outside. Where is it located? Where is the seed? Inside. The seed is inside. When you're born again. Whoa, what does all this mean? One step further, okay? One step further. The seed, when you are born again, when you're baptized, you receive the spirit, and then there's a seed that comes in here. Well, 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 okay, let's see. Seed, seed, where have I heard this before? Megan, where have I heard this before, seed? Hmm. Genesis, maybe? Chapter 3, perhaps? Verse 15. Can you go there with me? Genesis 3.15. Okay, so let me give you a little context. Eve and Adam had just sinned. Okay, God asked them questions, and they didn't repent or whatever. Um, they didn't take responsibility, so I said, all right, step aside, kids. I'll, I'll be back to you. Comes to the serpent, and then he says to the serpent, nothing. He doesn't say, hey, why have you done this? No, no, no. He just begins, and he says, I will put between you and the woman. And then he, get, he gets clearer. God, he says, between your seed and her seed. That means that Satan has a seed. Yeah? We're born in it. We are born with that seed. Lord, have mercy. We are born with that seed that plagues my mind, that plagues my body. But God says, I, who? Does it say you will put another seed inside you? Or He says, I will put enmity, or I will put that seed in you that hates sin. See, that seed that is within that hates sin. How many of you hate sin? Can I get an amen if you hate sin? I hate it. And we may be inclined to say, but I like it because I do it. No, no, no. Understand that when God does this work here, here, we hate sin. I hate sin. I admit I am a sinner. I admit that I have sin, but I hate it every time. I'm disgusted with it. I just want to, blah. That's why I hate this body. Who will deliver me from this body? I need to be delivered. Well, praise God, because John said that when you're born again, you don't sin. Because there is a seed that is in you. Oh, look, just flip over. It's not that far. Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. Look, we... We are, uh, our seasons change, but God, he remains the same. Genesis 13, 16. Look at what God is telling Abraham, okay? God is telling Abraham, hey, listen, I'm going to read this from uh, the NKJV, okay? I'm going to switch here a little bit because sometimes, and I'll tell you why in just a second. It says right here, Genesis 13, 16. You there with me? God tells Abraham, and I will make your what? Your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if, you, if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants will also could be numbered. Is there any other version that has a different word right there? 
Anybody else? Offspring, maybe? You're a seed. Interesting. Let me read one more. Genesis, just flip over to Genesis chapter 17 now. 17, it's just a couple pages over. Now let's look at verse 8. This is, again, God, I guess, reiterating this promise to Abraham. And he says, also, I give to you and your seed. After you, the land in which you are a stranger, the, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So here it is. In Genesis, there's this seed that is promised, this enmity. I'm going to send the seed. And now God, you know, your Bible may translate it as descendants or offspring, but in the original Hebrew, in all three of these texts, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 16.18, and Genesis 17.8, that word is the same one, seed. You want to learn a little bit of Hebrew? Zerah. Can you say Zerah? Zerah. Zerah. That's Hebrew for seed. And all of this is interesting because in Galatians, go with me to Galatians. Okay, we're wrapping it up here in Galatians. Check this out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Mm-hmm. I'm going to read it in my version or the version that I typically preach from first so you can see something. And then I'll read it in the NKJV. Okay? Galatians 3, 16. Are we there? All right. Who gave the promise? God. Okay? It begins with God gave the promises and his ch to Abraham. And his, his seed. Look, look, look what it says here. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. That's what the NLT says, his child. You would think, right, that it would say God gave the promise to Abraham and his children. But it doesn't. It says God gave the promise to Abraham and his child. Interesting. And then it says, even Paul says it. And notice that the scripture doesn't say what? To seeds, or in my version, to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child or to his seed. And that, of course, David didn't say it. Pastor Dave didn't say it. What does Paul say? The Bible says it. Who is that seed? We can go home. We can go home. What is all this Greek and Hebrew? Mom? By the way, just another, I'm just going to throw it in there. That word that is used, that Paul used, is now Greek. It's not Hebrew anymore. But in the, um, this lexicon here, the Thayer's Greek lexicon, there's a little note that says, from Homer down Hebrew, zerah, which means seed which means that Paul was specifically making this connection to Genesis 3.15 and these other texts here where Abraham is being promised that his seed, not his seeds, not his offspring, but his one seed, which is Jesus, is going to receive the kingdom and all the glory. Well, that's terrible for me. It's terrible for me because that promise is not for me. Whoa, you forgot about what John said. Because John said that when we're born again, the seed, and that's why we don't sin, because it's not we that don't sin, but it's Jesus who doesn't sin. And it is growing, and there's... There are two natures now living within, if you follow these steps. Here comes the practical application. Okay. Hmm. Two natures living within me. How many have you experienced this? This swing, this pendulum swing between, like, I'm sinning and, like, I hate sin. I'm sinning and I hate sin. Do you know why that is? Because inside you, 
That is if there is a pendulum swing. Some may not care. And if you don't care, then perhaps you need to be born again. But if you care and if you sense it, that means that Jesus is living in you. Can we get amen? amen. But unfortunately, that means that the old man is also living in there. And let me read a little something interesting about crucifixion, okay? This is very interesting. It says here that blood loss from the scourging helped determine the time the victim survived. In any case, the victim suffered a long time, at most days, before falling into prolonged unconsciousness and then death. What that all is saying is that crucifixion was not meant to be instantaneous. You were there for days, still alive, suffering. And it says, soldiers typically did not hasten things along because a long and painful death was the point of the execution method. Usually the victim was left on the cross until birds and wild beasts consumed the body. There's a lot of roadkill and there's a lot of birds I see pecking and that, just that imagery. But why did they speed up Jesus' death? Because of the Sabbath, okay? But typically, no, we leave them there. And look, listen, death could result from a variety of causes, including blood loss, hypovolemic shock or infection uh, caused by scourging that preceded the crucifixion. You know, all those, uh, you can get infected. Dehydration. A doctor says that um, he had a theory that when the whole body weight was supported with the stretched out arms, you like would suffocate, right? But check this out. It is possible to survive crucifixion. Don't miss this. It is possible to survive crucifixion, if not prolonged. And there are records of people who did. The historian Josephus, a Judean who defected to the Roman side during the Jewish uprising, blah, 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 describes finding two of his friends crucified. He begged for and was granted their reprieve. One died while the other recovered. Josephus gives no details of the method or duration of the crucifixion before their reprieve. But the point is, one of those guys who was crucified came back to life. So when we say we must crucify the old man, when Paul says you must crucify him, that's why Jesus said you must take up your cross. There's an adjective there. It begins with a D, daily. Because the old man can come back. And if we feed the old man, It's like two dogs in a fight. Which dog will win? Let's say we have two dogs we don't support or, uh, you know, uh, dog fights or anything. But for the sake of an illustration, let's say one dog here, we feed him pedigree or whatever for three months. And this other dog here, you know, we uh, just a little glass of water here, maybe a little bit here just to kind of keep him alive. And then comes the big showdown. And they both get in a fight. Who's going to win? Some have said, well, that one because he's hungrier. <laughs> you know, they told, they, we have a cat. And they said, we, if we want the cat to go hunting, we actually have to feed the cat. Don't, it's a misconception that don't feed the cat so that he can go. You need energy. So which one will win? The one that's well fed. And quite frankly, there are two natures that are within us, which nature are we feeding the most is the question. And how do we feed each nature? Well, the world certainly takes care of feeding that sinful nature. But we have to be intentional. And I want to end with this. I wish Mark was here, man. Um, sister, why don't you play us something? I want to end with this. Listen. The seed. The seed is where? Inside. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. The seed is where? I'm going to throw something, so catch it. Okay? When a seed enters a woman, what does that represent? A baby. And how did that happen? Intimacy. Did it not? 
know there's a passage that we're going to read. It's the last one that we're going to read. But in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, God said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and they will become one flesh. Now go with me, our last text here, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. Ephesians 5, 32. It says, as the script, verse 31, as the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. What do you guys think they were talking? It's a honeymoon, okay? Those who are old enough, catch what I'm throwing, all right? It's a honeymoon. What happens at the honeymoon? What happens when you come together? A seed goes inside, right? And it says here, this is a great mystery, but I, it's an illustration, or I am speaking of, what does it say in your Bible? Of Christ and the church. This whole baptism thing, this whole seed going inside really reminds me of a marriage, an intimate relationship. And that is how you feed that seed that is in here. You are intimate. You are the bride and he is the husband. I am the bride and he is the husband. Let me tell you. Church can be mechanical. You can come to church. You can come and do all of this. But that is not how you are intimate with your significant other. I want you to pause for a moment and consider how you are intimate with your loved one, with your significant other, the things that you do, the activities that you do together, the conversations that you have together. Are those the conversations that you're having with God, or is everything mechanical? Is everything, oh, oh I got to come here, and like, Lord, thank you for the day. Please be with my job. Please be with my school. Please take care of me. Because is this how we are intimate with one another in relationship, yes or no? No, absolutely not. And if it becomes mechanical like that, it is not what God is looking for. God is looking for you, your heart, your intimacy with him in everything you do. That is how a marriage, that is how a seed inside gains strength. And in the time of war, guess who will win? Because certainly a lot of us or most of us maybe have met a temptation to betray our spouse in some shape or form. It's not just with another person, but in different ways. But love for that spouse has stopped us, has it not? That's it. If you're catching what I'm throwing, that is the practical. You've got to make God your husband. You've got to make Jesus your husband. It cannot be mechanical. And Philippians 4.8 is a great way to feed that good man, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is worthy of praise, it humbles you. Do we have a song? Why don't we sing? Can we stand? And as we sing this final song, think about these things and think about the intimacy between you and our Jesus. Sing to him as if you were singing to your spouse.
holding the tears you have seen your people and this is what you want you don't want mechanical worship you don't want a checklist I'm going to church I'm, I did my thing as a Christian you want friends and you have heard the heart of your people you've heard them say that you're their friend He's my friend. God, I want to see you again. Come soon.